Hello, um, this is the final session on TikTok called TikTok and Social Movement. And we are welcoming you to the final session featuring four people, um, the session for grassroots and community. Um, let's get started with Ignatis because we don't have time. So I am over to you. Hello, um, and um, thank you, um, everybody, uh, for the opportunity. And uh, without further ado, I will uh, get into my presentation looking at TikTok uh, in Zimbabwe. Um, and I will be very quick um, and try and uh, be brief um, in terms of um, the sorry the aims um it's um the research is mainly trying to understand the growing popularity of tiktok as um, a new media platform in zimbabwe and also to understand why um the citizens of an african country like zimbabwe um you know becoming members of the tiktok global community and also to just study the kind of messages um that are being created and shared uh, by Zimbabweans um, on, on TikTok and what those uh, messages mean. Um, what I can um, tell you is um, the, I will try and just be brief in terms of you know, the approach um, where I used content analysis and I looked at 10 um, a most followed TikTokers uh, in Zimbabwe and um, did a partial analysis of the characteristics uh, of their TikTok uh, voice mess uh, video messages. Um, and I would have loved to, to talk about the sample size, but um, that is something that um, I can you know, talk about if I do have time um, towards the end, because I mainly want um, to share the research findings. Um, and um, also the justification of you know, why followers and not likes or views. Uh, I decided to settle for followers because these are people who have made a deliberate decision to establish a relationship and maintain that relationship through getting regular updates uh, from the content creators. Um, so I looked at the most watched videos um, and um, I would have loved to you know, look at a lot of other um, elements, uh, but then again, my fear and what was then that the research uh, would you know, get very big. Um, so, and also it's important to understand that this research is more to enable a preliminary investigation, which can be further developed um, because we seem not to have any formal academic research uh, that has been done or undertaken um, in Zimbabwe on TikTok. Um, so the top 10 um, Zim TikTokers, I will not draw much uh, on this, but uh, just to share with you that um, we have, um, as you can see, 10 and F stands for female and M for male. And um, so I have their followers and the number of total likes. Um, and what you, well, as, as I will explain later um, in the findings, you see an interesting you know, analysis in terms of um, you know, gender representation and even age. Um, and then I picked two of the most watched uh, videos um, from each of the TikTokers. Um, for analysis, and uh, as you can see, you know, some almost in, in millions and uh, some in thousands and so forth. Um, the topics um, that were mostly and consistently um, uh, they shared or the, the topics that were coming up um, are the following, the, uh, you know, there's uh, entertainment, uh, acting, fashion, dance, fun, music, relationships, um, and comedy. And it's important to notice that uh, four of the TikTokers are musicians or have some music, dancing, uh, and singing uh, background. Um, but this is a very important observation um, or finding that all top 10 Zimbabwean TikTokers 
either define themselves as comedians or some of their products are classified as comedy. And there's also four out of 10 uh, of some of the most watched videos carry messages about sex or that have you know, sexual innuendos. Um, then there's uh, a lot of stereotyping. Four out of the 10 content creators use stereotyping to do with appearance or a person's character and lifestyle. Um, and like I noticed, the stereotypes are often a collection of uh, prejudices, and we can um, look at that later. Then um, five TikTokers live in Zimbabwe, and five others are um, in foreign countries. And um, it is generally believed that uh, over five million Zimbabweans um, currently live in other countries, and this is to do with the social, political, and economic situation in Zimbabwe. Um, and the content by Zimbabweans residing in other countries tends to incorporate cultural products, practices, and perspectives from other countries other than those that they are uh, now residing in. Um, then celebrities and influencers. So before becoming TikTokers, only two of the 10 content creators were known publicly or were public figures. Um, and um, we noticed that uh, you know, the celebrity evolution in the 20th century is intimately related to the evolution of technologies uh, you know, for making individuals uh, public. And again, it's a reflection of uh, the historical conditions as uh, Terry Egoton um, you know, puts it from a Marxist um, theorist uh, point of view that um, you know, the historical, historical conditions produce um, you know, a certain type of content. And here we are talking of uh, celebrity culture. Um, again, still on the same topic, um, overall, we notice there's serious work and time invested um, in the productions uh, and there's some unique content, but there's also piggybacking where creators are using other popular artists products or popularity to make themselves popular. And six out of the 10 content creators piggyback on and imitate already popular art forms uh, in the form of music, dance, and videos. Um, and so we can say Zim TikTokers are recycling the popular to win followers, views, and likes, but not so much for transformative uh, purposes. Um, I'll probably skip that. And still looking at uh, TikTok, uh, is it a new culture? TikTok is certainly defining the type of media it is and not what media scholars expect. Um, through followers, likes, and most viewed uh, videos, um, TikTok is indicating what preferences and content type most audiences desire. But this, again, requires um, you know, a little bit of more interrogation, more inquiry. Um, technologies. Uh, are not value neutral, but reflect the cultural bias, values, and communicative preferences of their designers, according to Yin, um, 2015. And again, this is something that I hope, you know, we will try and unpack. Um, and TikTok use by Zimbabweans is also a confirmation um, that a new media with a new culture is emerging, and that are also this use of TikTok in Zimbabwe is not yet an integral part of people's lives due to a Thank number of Marius, factors. Sorry and... to interrupt you, but um, this is time, so could you wrap up? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have issues to do with uh, poverty and lack of in infrastructure um, as a problem. And also TikTok uh, used by Zimbabweans does not yet compete with or complement mainstream media the way Twitter, Facebook, um, and Instagram um, doing. So in terms of um, TikTok, we can say um, the TikTok content producers in Zimbabwe need to become educators and they need to you know, transcend the, well, let me say the comedy that, you know, we are seeing at the moment, probably to move into areas of universal decolonization of the mind. Uh, but I can say Zimbabwean TikTok content creators um, are emerging leaders and teachers who 
may need to actually take us to a place where we can see a formation or a creation of a public sphere um, and where we actually see that as Spivak noted, the sub don't remain in sub uh, or are unable to represent themselves and therefore needing to be represented. There is certainly potential, but we need to see how this is going to develop, um, if it is going to develop into something really you know, robust and transformative um, at all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignatius. That was a wonderful um, TikTok presentation. Now let's moving towards um, China again. Um, Zizeng is presenting his paper, Protest Against the Business with Doing an Innovative Repertoire for Chinese Consumers. So over to you, Zizeng. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. OK, let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen here? Yes, yeah, so we can see your presentation slide. Okay, okay. Oh, so uh, hello everyone. So thanks for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my research about Douyin and how Chinese consumers protest against business uh, with Douyin. So um, first, let me just uh, share a screen. Okay. Here is the abstract of my research. So uh, as you can see that uh, in China, like um, in many short video based social media platforms such as Douyin, uh, one of the most uh, represented one, are becoming a common tool for an increasing number of consumers to safeguard their rights and interests in China. However, but very few studies have explored this kind of uh, short video activism tactics of Chinese consumers. So in my research, I'm going to uh, bring in together the literature on uh, consumer activism, the repertoire of contention and doing, and interviewing uh, 24 interviewees in four groups from uh, Chinese consumers, media practitioners, uh, PR officials from the business, and also the relevant government officials, and looking into one consumer activism event, uh, which is the do not buy anything on PDD, and I will explain more on this case later. And this research just shows that um, the short video activism tactics have become an innovative uh, repertoire of contention for Chinese consumers with the help of media coverage, short video technologies, and uh, Douyin and other SVV platforms. So um, because like uh, since everyone here in this uh, um, workshops are talking about the TikTok, uh, the Douyin's in global impact. So here I want to stress out more about the Douyin in China. So Douyin uh, was founded in 2016 and in the beginning, it just positioned itself as an online uh, music community. But only a few years later, the content on Douyin just uh, go beyond the music uh, contents and there are many, many other contents emerged such as tra travel uh, introduction, TV series or movie commentary or foreign language learning and food recommendations and social news, dance, music, talk shows, and even Chinese martial arts we can see on Douyin. So <clears throat> just ex exploring the contents on Douyin and you will come across uh, all kinds of surprises. So as a result, Douyin just changed their slogan to uh, make your day, real people, real videos, and they redefine themselves as a general uh, short video based platforms for everyone, but not a, only a music community for music fans only. So the latest uh, figures saying uh, Douyin has more than 680 million uh, domestic daily active users in China as of April 2021. And here are some unique characteristics of Douyin compared to uh, TikTok. So even though they belong to uh, the same companies like the ByteDance in China, so they have actually different uh, entities. Like for Douyin, like their content on Douyin are more diversified and in extensive short video content. And the Douyin users <coughs> base compose different age levels. 
And you can see on the uh, right hand side here a screenshot of a police station. Uh, they launched their account on Douyin to advertise themselves and publish content related to them. So there are many uh, Chinese government departments, medias, and NGOs uh, use Douyin to advertise themselves and trying to keep up with the trend of the short video age. So here, the second point is uh, Douyin's more advanced e-commerce feature. So you can see um, here's a, a description from the job from the New Yorker. So it's a really uh, simple and correct description about the e-commerce feature of Douyin. So you, you can see on the right hand side here about the screenshot is like uh, many uh, influencer debut advertise the products on their live streaming show. So here, uh, the male figure the influencer here is the one of the famous uh, influencers in China. And he always <clears throat> trying to advertise lipsticks and any other uh, makeup products in his live streaming show. And for the viewers or the users of Douyin or his followers can just click the link he provided in the screen and just buy the product instantly. And the third uh, <coughs> uh, unique characteristic of Douyin is there are more restrictions on Douyin because of uh, the government restrictions and different kinds of uh, rules lodged by the government departments. So uh, on the content creation, the Biden censors political content closely and in line with the government. And other content that does not conform to the uh, mainstream social values in China of the Chinese social society will also be banned and removed uh, on doing. And <clears throat> recently they just launched a, a, a new uh, rules. It says like the users under the age of 14 will automatically enter the youth mode after turning on doing. And in this mode, they can only use doing for 40 minutes a day and cannot use it between 10 p.m. and 6 p.m. at uh, 6 a.m. But even so, the ByteDance and the Douyin still leaves a gap for the Chinese consumers to use Douyin to protest against business and pro protect their rights and interests. So in my research, uh, I adopt two uh, methodologies. And uh, the first one is the individual semi-scratcher interview. And the second one is a case study. Case study. <clears throat> And let's start with a short video that was widely well known on Douyin in 2018. So let me have a let let's have a look on this short video. Okay. So in this video, it can be seen that a consumer was going to use the electric sh uh, shaver he recently bought from PDD. When he turned on the switch, the head of the electric uh, shaver did not work normally. Instead, it just um, <clears throat> the knife head just rotating uh, strangely and just showed the shaver in his hand. The, the knife head just fell to the ground as spinning around like a toy top. So under the name uh, electric uh, shaver bot on PDD, this short video went viral and reposted by many uh, Douyin users around July 2018. And even though <clears throat> PDD claimed in his uh, press conference later that the content show in this short video was not accurate, this short video still caused a huge brand damage to uh, the PDD. And <clears throat> uh, even it is obvious that most people share this short video with other people because it was uh, hilarious. And this short video still play an essential role in the later short video activism boycott against PDD. And more specifically, um, this short video together with other short videos showing the poor quality of uh, counterfeit goods sold on PDD um, caused uh, a huge damage to PDD's uh, brand damage brands. And including this, uh, this short video I present here around July 2018, and many short video clips showing the poor quality of counterfeit goods sold on uh, PDD were uploaded by users of PDD at separate times, but with similar hashtags on Douyin 
and the hashtags such as uh, you get what you pay for uh, or counterfeit goods or do not buy anything on PDD or I bought this from T PDD on doing. Hi, Zizang. <clears throat> sorry so, to interrupt you, but you need to wrap up now. Okay, sorry. Uh, so um, the findings of this research show that uh, Chinese consumers have uh, witnessed and recognized and learned the efficiency of the short video algorithm tactics and the corresponding uh, now that logic uh, through media reports and other short, uh, popular short videos on Douyin. And this kind of uh, tactics have, be have become an innovative uh, repertoire of contention for Chinese consumers. And also the Douyin uh, and other SVB platforms have become a new format and a database for storing and spreading this uh, repertoire of contention in the context of China. And so that's all for my uh, uh, presentation today. And here you can see there are many other uh, latest examples of how consumers use uh, Douyin to uh, show the, the evidence that they bought a counterfeit products on PDD. And that's all for my uh, presentation today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zizang. That was wonderful um, about consumer activism in China. There was a difficult technical issue on Isa's um, hand. So let's start it with Elshu. So Elshu is uh, presenting regimatic TikTok post to students protest on laws in Indonesia. So over to you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jin. Uh, let me share my presentation. Okay, yeah, um... perfect. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Esther Putri Wolujung uh, from Department of Sociology, Universitas Indonesia. I will present on my latest research. The title is Rhizomatic TikTok, uh, TikTok Post, a Student Protest on Laws in Indonesia. Okay. In this presentation, I will share the introduction and then social movement as micropolitic, rhizome change and multiplicity as theoretical framework, and then multimedia to rhizome, uh, students movement and on Indonesian laws as data and analysis, and then what is semantic change, the other social media, the other issues, the other, and the other determinant as further analysis. Okay, in Indonesia, uh, student movement has impact since the colonial era, after the long pause since the reformasi era or the reformation uh, in 1998, the students uh, strike again twice in a row. The first one is reformasi di korupsi or corrupted reformation on September 2019, and then the second one is omnibus law. Uh, on October 20, uh, 2020. And then those movements uh, are hybrid social movement. Uh, in today's politics, uh, physical and digital spaces cannot be separated. Moreover, the hybridis hybridization also happens in each space, space uh, like between two or more platforms and its algorithmic component. And, and on, uh, on those uh, actions, uh, there are one of the platforms that have risen, uh, TikTok. Okay. Based on the study from Jali and Irwansha, uh, TikTok's potential usage for movement is high, especially in Southeast Asia and Indonesia. And then, and then from the hashtag and views from those uh, cases uh, has increased them dramatically. Uh, in reformasi di korupsi, uh, the number of views in the top hashtag is about millions, and then in the omnibus case is about billions, so has increased dramatically. Okay, uh, based on that condition, I argue that TikTok able to bind a network in the form of results because the TikTok algorithm is part of the semiotic chains, including the user value. The semiotic chains will connect the physical and digital spaces. It also connect to the other digital activism platforms like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And then the TikTok usage will also provoke the other individuals uh, who are not participating in the street protest to participate in creative actions through their posts. The multiplicity posts are rhizomatic molecules that connect through the same hashtag, music, content, audience response, as semiotic chains. Um, and then in this study, uh, I define social movement based on the study of us now at all. Uh, social movement uh, is collectivities give voice to their grievances and concern about the right, welfare, and well-being of themselves and others by engaging in various types of collective action, ranging from peaceful protest demonstration to acts of political violence, uh, from pamphlet lettering to revolution, and from mass vigils memorializing disease constituents to boy stories gathering 
uh, clamoring for retribution, all of which dramatize those three offenses and concerns and demands that something be done about them. Uh, the characteristic of social movement relates with the characteristic of rhizome as micropolitics, which have connection with the micropolitics. Uh, Delus and Guattari explain that everything that is political has micropolitical and micropolitical elements. However, in the structural process, there are molecules that move to influence a policy. These molecules are rhizomes, which are connected, heterogeneous, and always uh, perform multiplicity. Okay. Uh, the rhizomatic process also relates with TikTok. Uh, a social media that has a big potential for social movement. Uh, uh, TikTok algorithm is like a semantic change from the hashtag, linkage music, music, caption, content, including the response of the user. And then TikTok also has special menu to do multiplicity, like the duet menu or using the same music, or like a post with the same music. Uh, even canceling process is also part of the multiplicity process. Also by viewing something viral, we also push the other to produce the similar content. Okay, and then this is the part of my data and analysis. Uh, multimedia data resume, students' movement on innovation law. It is consists of three parts. The first one is student movement and the tales of two laws, uh, students' protest on corrupted reformation and law on generation. And then rhizomatic and multiplicity TikTok post. Uh, the last one is hybridization. Okay, uh, as uh, we can see in the screen, um, both of them are uh, the laws that the students have against. The first one is reformasi di korupsi, and the second one is omnibus law. The similarity between those actions are uh, they reject uh, the laws that the uh, the, the state uh, provide to the public. Uh, okay, and uh, besides reject the uh, the some laws, uh, they also propose some laws that the government need to approve or legalize soon, like RUU PKS. Um, and then uh, to, um, to fulfill their demands, they did some uh, action. Uh, one of them is uh, post in TikToks. And then um, based on the uh, content, uh, I can classify the content uh, in four types. The first one is fast transformation from street protest to the digital content. The second one is opinion and response on the issues. The third one is with the entire post. The, uh, the last is further information on the issues. Uh, but the typology of the content uh, can be intersected to each other. So it is not mutually exclusive. This is the example uh, for the first type, uh, space transformation from street protest to the digital content. Uh, this, uh, the, 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 student, the students share when they have act in the street protest. Uh, they use uh, student identity, uh, symbol and attribute like the flag, and they use Pexon, Brutanium, Bebasan, which is very common into uh, uh, student movement. And then for the second one is opinion and respond on the, the issues. Uh, the type of content is uh, verbal, audio, text, visual, and every component of the post is uh, every component of the post has meanings uh, for them. Uh, for example, if you see at the uh, right corner uh, from the tweet, uh, uh, the, the poster uh, did not say anything. Uh, he just shared the music and the visualization. But the lyric of the music is part of uh, criticizing part of the critic to the tweets from the people. Okay. And the last one is witty and uh, parody post. Uh, uh, usually it is satirical uh, parody uh, or we create something from the uh, previous one, the famous one, uh, or Mr. Mabasa said like uh, piggy banking, and then uh, it's canceling content. Uh, multiplicity also tend uh, to be, eh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, witty and parody post also tend to be uh, multiply cited. Uh, like doing duet or use the audio uh, to share the same content. And the last one is for the information on the issue. Um, and this is uh, where or uh, when uh, the student share any kind of information about the, the law, like uh, the omnibus case and how uh, omnibus case uh, and then the reformasi di corruption case uh, or corrupt reformation case. They just add any uh, kind of information about the law. And then uh, beside the content, uh, the hashtag is also part of uh, the semiotic chains. Uh, Macrusian and Blokin explains uh, the hashtag is a semantic navig navigation mechanism in social media that has meaning related to the whole message, whether it is too broad or too narrow. Uh, semiotic chains do not only occur between posts within the same hashtag, but the relation between hashtags are also bound by uh, semantic ties and thesaurus, as you can see on the screen. Uh, uh, reformasi di korupsi or corrupt reformation 
corrupted information or has similar hashtag with uh, with similar um, semantic or word. And then the second one is omnibus law. Um, it is also the same. And the last one is RO Cipta Kerja. RO Cipta Kerja mean uh, job creation bill. It is the official name of the omnibus law, but uh, people tend to use omnibus law than the official name. Okay. Okay, that's on the okay for oh, the hybridization process. Um, uh, as we can see from the content uh, and the hashtag and and kind of data, uh, we can divide in endogenous, ex exogenous, and structural uh, hybridization. Exogenous is inside the platform, exogenous between platform and the other space, and the structural relation between the molecule to the bigger structure. Okay, okay I will wrap it up. Okay, and then I based on the study, I conclude. Uh, TikTok is rhythm and part of the bigger rhythm in the movement context. And the semantic chains connect the algorithm, algorithmic component inside the TikTok, like content, hashtag, music, caption, audience response. And then the semantic chains also connect TikTok to the exogenous track, physical act, and the other platform. Semantic chains will push people to build new content and join the movement as multiplicity process. And every process of them is part of the micropolitics, which simultaneously connected with the structure as macropolitics. Thank you. I think that's my presentation. Thank you, Estu. That was great uh, presentation about Indonesia. So now we have Isa. Hey, Isa. Um, are you able Hello. to share the screen now? Yes. Are you able to view my screen? Yep, I can see that. All right. Thank you. I apologize for earlier. Uh, all right, without wasting any more time, let's get into it. Hi, uh, my name is Isa. I am an undergraduate student from Nottingham University. Um, I'd like to first and foremost thank you uh, for to the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to present my paper. Um, my paper in particular focuses on the disability community's fight for visibility and representation um, on TikTok. So in particular, I show how notable TikTok creators, uh, TikTok creators with disabilities, defy ongoing stigma surrounding their existence through subversive and satirical humor in response to negative reception that they receive to freely exercise um, self-expression. So for my research, I have chosen to view American youth content creators with a large following, um, namely Not Louie and I'm a Roll With It. And the reason why I chose them is because <clears throat> their videos are centered uh, around humor that have received um, a high engagement. And I looked into the ways that these creators deal with negative perceptions um, in their moments of virality, which is through their comedic nature of the videos. So firstly, it's important to note that representation of characters with disability has seen an increase in mainstream media, but the numbers are not especially groundbreaking. Um, for example, only 3.5% of characters in mainstream TV are represented um, as with disabilities. And even when they are represented, they are susceptible to misrepresentation, such as being reduced to villains or saviors because of their disabilities. Um, even Instagram, which despite undoubtedly being a space that has pushed for advocacy um, on disabilities before, um, reduces the lived in realities of content creators with disabilities into concepts. If you look at their guidelines on monetization, for example, it explicitly states that in order for you to showcase your, um, your content, if you are a person with disabilities, it has to be shown in an explicitly uplifting manner. So what this does is it reduces them, uh, they are not able to tell their own stories and they um, do not have the power to uh, be seen with their own stories and narrative, which renders them um, invisible until TikTok. So throughout the existence of TikTok, there has been an ongoing discovery that more and more marginalized communities have been gaining traction and visibility on the app. Um, this could be chalked up to TikTok's very frivolous and sort of edgy humor that, um, while it has gotten more polished over time, allows for a more malleable approach with its relatively straightforward objective. Um, it focuses on creating, uh, on creativity, and it, because of that, it allows for freedom in making content um, that focuses less on idealized notions of the self, thus extending a wider sense of belonging to communities, particularly the disability community. And the fact that it's in short form and bite-sized video is pretty much like an added bonus. Um, and it's unique as it humanizes people behind them. So because of this, the disability community finds opportunities for themselves to make space 
for their own visibility within the platform. And as you can see, um, I was introduced to a myriad of uh, content creators and they have amassed a huge number of followings up until the millions and their content receives high engagement to match. Um, for example, my two case studies, Not Louie and I'm a Roll With It or Mia, um, they, for example, Not Louie, he focuses heavily on skits that revolve around his disability and the view count rakes in like tens of thousands of views. And Mia as well, who focuses a lot on like funny skits and also point of views and also spreads awareness and uh, on disabilities and accessibilities. But while this is great, it as in it gives more visibility uh, towards the disability community in general, um, it comes with the drawbacks, which in this case is um, negative comments. Uh, sorry, hold on. Right, so these negative receptions and these ableist tendencies are a common fact for um, content creators. They receive this very often. And what this does is it points towards a disregard to their individuality and validating their experiences. Like for example, doubting whether these people actually have disabilities and ultimately reinforces the stigma behind them. But rather than accepting this situation, these creators have found many workarounds towards addressing these negative receptions. And the way to do that is through humor. So one of, I would like to show you a few uh, videos that employ this method. Um, for the first video, this, um, bear in mind that it does have a lot of profanities and uses quite sensitive language, but um, I'll play it now. Right, so this particular video has garnered more than 7 million views and 2 million likes. And what it does is it highlights the engagement, not only between him and the vast majority of non-disabled people, but rather the sound that um, was from his video is then re uh, reused by um, hundreds and hundreds of other videos of cre content creators with disabilities um, to join in on. And the tendency for these types of humor provides a segue towards a connection between people. And it isn't looked upon as disturbing or even objectifying. Rather, it showcases the shared reality of many other people with disabilities taken in a lighthearted manner. But with that being said, the tendency to make jokes about their own disabilities has in some cases been a double-edged sword. So non-disabled people has taken it upon themselves to make fun of them as well. But again, the response is not compromising to the reality. So Mia here makes a mockery of the insensitive joke and then addresses it later on. Hi, Isa. We can't hear voice, um, actually. Oh, I, oh, I apologize. Um, oh, my apologies. Okay, I will replay the two videos, um, if that's okay. Maybe we can have, we don't have a time. Maybe we can just play one, if that's okay with you. Hey guys, here's the fit. Are you able to hear the sound now? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. I woke up feeling a little extra crippled, so I know it's gonna be a nice long day of doing disabled person things. Might go out in public, make people uncomfortable with my disability. Then I'll come home, take a fat shit, struggle to wipe my ass and proceed to fall off the toilet. Right, so as I said, this video, um, it, it's quite, you know, it provides a segue to, to connect with people and a lot of other content creators with disabilities have shared um, their videos as well using the sound. And for the second video uh, here. In all honesty, I can't stand it. I can't even stand myself, but I'm gonna roll with it. And here we have a prime example of someone making fun of me and my disability, the fact that I can't stand, versus me making a joke about myself and my own disability. There is a massive difference between making fun of something that you personally struggle with versus you making a joke about something that someone else is struggling with. 
Me, as a disabled individual, I can make jokes about my own experiences and my own disability, but it is never, ever my place to make fun of someone else's disability or some struggle that someone else is going through that I have not experienced. I hope that makes a little more sense. Right. So even with the these self-inflicted roasts and jokes, um, it does signal that there is an establishment of boundaries. And the fact that they are outwardly saying that this is not okay, it's a reclamation of discursive authority. Um, content creators with disabilities are reclaiming their narrative and they are controlling the way their stories are being told. So by employing... Hey guys, here's uh, sorry today. about that. All right. So by employing a tongue-in-cheek like response... Hey, to, I'm sorry to sorry? interrupt you, but you need to wrap up now. Ah, okay. All right. So um, I guess by employing tongue-in-cheek response to negativity um, alongside comical rendition, they're able to like sustain their visibility and take control of their own story because humor fosters connection and allows Louis for them to be seen by the general public. Um, okay, so in conclusion, I'd be remiss to not mention the fact that now it's, uh, their fight is still ongoing, but not without limitations. For example, TikTok now is a very um, controversial in the fact that they're shadow banning a lot of content creators with disabilities and outright banning their accounts. But with the growing community, there has been very strong support. For example, Not Louis' account was, imme uh, was immediately unbanned two weeks after um, his account was banned because of the flood of uh, messages from his followers. So in conclusion, I believe that because this this method of um, defying against stigma, it's giving visibility and representation to the disability community in general. And it's also a budding field for new dialogues and topics for discussion, um, examples of which center around like freedom of expression and the overall representation of disabilities, um, which can lead to demystification in future. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation about disability and ableism and TikTok. So now we have about seven minutes and 10 minutes um, Q&A session. So let's start it with a question I got from the uh, via DM. The first question to Zizang is, can you tell us more about the response to boycott and activism on doing? Um, is there now platform competition between Pin? I'm um, sorry, I'm not familiar with this app. Sorry, Pinion Duo and Doing. How brands taken to Doing to push back against these accusations? Okay, thank you so much for uh, these questions. Actually, I have uh, see uh, another uh, Viewers raised another questions and it's similar, kind of similar to this one. So I'm going to answer them uh, at the same, at, in one. Okay, so uh, for Chinese consumers, they use uh, the short video, uh, uh, short videos to protest uh, against the business. So in how, so for example, they will upload the, the short video evidence to this short video based social media platforms such as Douyin. And the reason why uh, people use this kind of uh, short video based social media platforms to protest because of the strength of the short videos but not the, uh, the unique characteristic of these platforms because for Chinese consumers or anybody, you can imagine uh, if they want to use these kind of tactics, they will upload their short video evidence to all of this short video based uh, social media platforms. For example, they will upload it to Douyin, they will upload it to Weibo, they will upload it to WeChat at the same time. And even though they only upload it to Douyin, for example, these short videos, if they are uh, eye-catching enough, they will uh, trans, uh, spread to other short video-based social, uh, social media platforms uh, immediately by other like uh, viewers or by the media. So it will uh, cause another huge impact to the uh, to the public to catch their eyeballs and to catch the eyeballs of the media and then make them report on this case and to cause the attention of the uh, business and then forge uh, urge them to correct their mistakes uh, or even even uh, a bigger impact it, it will call, uh, attract attention of the government departments to uh, the government will stand up and said, okay, let me 
uh, fix this problem for these uh, consumers. And for example, the Douyin issue, the outcome of the Douyin is the government uh, departments uh, launch a, a kind of uh, investigation to PDD and urge them to fix their uh, problems of the counterfeit goods on their platform, selling on their platforms. So, uh, and then the PDD also uh, release a kind of a new policies to uh, to request all the sellers on their platforms to remove all the counterfeit products on their platforms. So um, I hope this uh, answer can solve the problems you raised. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. And we have another question via DM um, to ask you. So um, she's asking the question, how, given the history of government interventions and mediation of the political and activist content in Indonesia, can you tell us more about how this space on TikTok has been evolving? Is content being censored? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Well, as far as I know, uh, in TikTok, uh, still safe. Uh, it is still better than Twitter or Instagram. Uh, the government more response on the uh, Twitter post and then uh, Instagram post. Uh, we have Undang Undang ITE, the law on information and technology uh, and transaction electronic, which uh, tend to be used uh, to catch someone who criticizes the government in the social media. But as far as I know, uh, the uh, 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 the people who get uh, uh, or people who against the law. Or against the law is uh, usually from Twitter or um, Instagram, moreover from WhatsApp, like uh, WhatsApp in group or private chat, um, and then someone uh, dislike the commentar, uh, the comments, and then uh, they use Undang Undang ITE, the law on uh, information and electronic trans transaction, and then use it to uh, catch them. Uh, like uh, the, the latest case is uh, one of acad academicians in Indonesia has uh, has been catched uh, by the government uh, because someone uh, uh, used the law to make them go to, go to the jail. I think that's it. TikTok, but still safe, but uh, the other platform more dangerous than uh, TikTok. Got it. Um, thank you so much. And another question to Ignatius. While TikTok is still nascent in Zimbabwe, what has it contributed to the early domination of comedic and sex content on the platform? Does this relate to the legacy of other platforms in the country or of popular influencer content genres? You are muted, um, Ignatius. Yeah. Yes, okay, yes. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, I think it's a very good question. Uh, what we are seeing um, on TikTok actually is when you compare it to the way uh, Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook has been used in Zimbabwe or is actually being used in Zimbabwe. Um, certainly we have problems, uh, um, you know, in how probably TikTok is emerging to be, you know, about you know, jokes and, and humor and, um, you know, probably failing because I, I even want to refer back to the punching up. You, you don't even quite, you know, get to, you know, see the punching up. It's more of, um, you know, what you get to, um, I, I think it's Shakespeare who said, you know, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. You, you kind of ask yourself, so what? Um, but I think it's, it's, it's that need for that intentionality that I talked about, which is probably needed. And um, you see this kind of intentionality in, um, you know, in the way Twitter is actually being used. Um, and, um, you know, the, the Zimbabwean government is actually, you know, has had, you know, several issues with, um, you know, people using Twitter, trying to silence them. So, but, you know, at the moment, TikTok, well, they just allow it to, you know, just run as it is. Um, it's, 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 I, I don't think it's something that's, you know, giving any problems to anybody. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, three questions to Isa, but 
because of we don't have enough time, let's go to just one. And then you can probably just answer to these questions by yourself via typing or something. So the first question, um, I will, um, the question is, what do you predict for the future of a disability community on TikTok? Are they gaining enough momentum to push TikTok and other um, submits to amend their TNC to be more inclusive? Or what of their impact to the general discourse on disability as a whole? This is a very great question, but I know it's difficult to answer. So please take up anyway. Um, granted, uh, well, in my personal view, I think that despite the fact that there is a lot of progress that has been made recently, especially in the last year, um, <laughs> I believe that through a lot of their uh, efforts to advocate, um, I think that it has sort of um, succeeded in that, uh, like the content creator that I mentioned just now, uh, Mia, she has actually been representative of um, uh, in real life where she went on towards um, modeling for a few uh, clothing lines and shows and stuff like that. So I think that, um, in terms of the future of this, the disability community on TikTok, it's very hard to say because TikTok right now is um, undergoing a lot of backlash and controversy with their shadow banning and banning and stuff like that. Um, but with, uh, but I think that it's it's a very difficult thing to to um, to predict. Um, but I think the general discourse is that more and more people are starting to listen, especially people who are able-bodied. They are starting to listen because the, the, the discourse has always been around, but now it's much more um, prominent and they're forced to sit down and actually listen to what these people have to say. So, yeah. Yep, um, thank you so much. And we have a few more questions to Ignatius and also Isa, but because we don't have enough time, I will leave these questions to Isa and, um, and also Ignatius to answer these questions by themselves, if that's okay with all of you. So let's close this whole um, long event. So thank you so much. For, sorry. Sorry, I just took, uh, pressed the wrong button. So thank you so much for joining this event. I really, really appreciate it. All of you, um, 16 panelists and also attendees and also um, our great, um, the Stella keynote speaker, Ariadna, and also all um, other people who worked so hard to help us with especially Cotton University and CCAT and also special thanks to Miss Linda Durek and wonderful artist and Mr. Crow for their help and work. We hope that you've learned a lot from our speakers inside for research on various movements on TikTok in the world. We also hope that this event serve as a platform for you to rethink about new culture and social movements on TikTok in relation to um, the things that we are, um, we are encountering in these days. We are keen to hear from you about your thoughts and ideas about TikTok research. So please use the exit survey to provide your feedback, which will be absolutely helpful for us to continue and expand our research network. As mentioned earlier in the in this event, our website to TikTokCultures.com um, is currently under construction, but will be updated soon with a new downloadable re downloadable reports on previous events and service and more work. So please check out our events for more information and also for the recordings of today's event. Lastly, the registration for the global membership of TikTok Cultures Research Network is open. So check out our website or see the link that will be posted soon in the chat. And next year, we will be hosting another wonderful symposium, TikTok Research Books Roundtable with wonderful scholars from all around the world with their great and insightful studies on TikTok. So play, please stay tuned. And lastly, I'd like to thank my co-organizers, Associate Professor Krista Abedin, and also Dr. Bundi Kaya, who worked really, really hard, even though you didn't see him. So please thank him a lot for this help and also organizing um, this event. And also TikTok Cultures Research Network was very supportive of, um, was hosted at this event. So thank you all. And that's it from me. And Thank you so much again for joining us. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of the day, 
morning or night, wherever you are. So we'll see you next year. And thank you so much. Bye.